following the research in fire, ideal game dialogues, writing tools, and design ideas, a quite popular Ghana Sutra post on game, dialogues user interfaces written by Daniel Giardini, and myself, when I had the chance to get back to developing the narrative. Part of football drama, I decided to create for the layout to lose for the writer. Building upon the research and done, one of the observations of the linked post was how much a rand feature rich are dialogues in contemporary comics with respect to today's games. As in the examples below, our dialogues in football drama were more or less in this format. From that P.O. Pounds are relevant. And I started designing possible evolutions, like in this draft, and not this fact that makes involving the design of dialogues in games. Not that is it is that dialogues are general in at least partially generative, and so is the case for our football drama game. So it's normal that the dialogues are generated by structures like this. This is our internal dialogue editor, outspoken. Developed in Unity by Daniel Giardini. What would be great would be to have the possibility to one configure single nodes, balloon appearance, and to configure alternative layouts of sequences of nodes. One for single speech balloons. We opted for having far classic layouts: thought, scream, speech, whisper. Two for the alternative layouts. We have three cases. A full screen layer that sends some message before or between dialogue exchanges. A node with a question and dumb choices as the first column in the draft illustration below. A couple of dialogue nodes where in the second node we want to zoom in the character. Second and third columns in the draft. You can see our solution in action for both cases one and two in the following video. So I hope this gives you some inspiration in designing tools for your game dialogues layouts. You can follow me on Twitter here. The German Consumer Protection Authority (VZBV) is taking Nintendo to cut over Nintendo's digital pre-order policies, specifically over the strict policy that eShop pre-orders cannot be cancelled. Eurogamer spotted a report from the Norwegian site. Press for that. Says the VZBV is well on its way to starting formal proceedings and has moved the entire case. The whole affair kicked off earlier this year in Norway, and the Norwegian consumer body behind that complaint has since been in communication with the VZBV in order to get this current case started in Nintendo of Europe's home country of Germany originally. The Norwegian Consumer Council accused Nintendo of violating the European Union's consumer rights direction that rules that customers in the EU and European economic area have the right to withdraw from a purchase if the product has yet to be distributed. Nintendo's terms affirm that all sales made on the eShop are final, including those made for games that have yet to release. Press Fire says that. In response to the earlier complaint, Nintendo claims that the ability to preload games following a pre-order means that distribution has, in a sense, begun after pre-order. Despite those games not yet being playable, China announced that it approved dated new game releases in late December, signaling the first wave of media authorized by the Online Games Ethics Committee. However, The list of approved titles does not seem to include any releases from Chinese tech giant Tencent. This report comes a few weeks after Chinese regulators began reviewing games submitted under license consideration in China, moving forward to end the licensing phrase that had halted game approvals for the majority of 2018, as reported by Reuters. These approved titles, listed on the website of the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film and Television, did not include games from industrial little Tencent.
the freeze has negatively impacted the company, and despite mobile revenue on the rise, the company has lost more than $200 billion of its overall value. Tencent be contesting facial recognition to verify player identities, and even restrict playtime in an attempt to appease the Online Games Ethics Committee, which was created to address concerns from Chinese officials who fear that video games are sparking addiction and impacting the productivity of the country's youth. Regulators have also prevented Tencent from monetizing popular games that were already on the market in China, including Fortnite and PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Gunnar Sutra editor Alex Voro continues our annual series of year-end roundups by looking back at some of the big events that shook up the game industry in 2018. A lot of long simmering game industry issues all over in 2018. As we noted yesterday, while looking back at the trends that defined the game's business this year, many long-time studios executed big layoffs, a shutdown entirely. Unionization in the game industry is a hot topic again. And in 2018 Game Workers Unite coalesced and seemed to focus years of chatter into meaningful statements and action. After years of giving chase, French media giant Vivendi finally gave up on trying to acquire Ubisoft and sold off its entire stake in the company to, among others, Ubisoft, Tencent, and the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Iconoclasts finally came out. 2018 was a long one. Before we put it behind us, let's think about which bits we will still be talking about in the year ahead. Telltale Games was not the only studio to fall this year, but it was among the biggest and the most beloved. Despite clear signs of trouble, including reports of a toxic work environment, a big round of layoffs last year, and a legal fight with Alstead, key oak of Imbruner, it was still a shock when Telltale initiated its majority studio closure in September, effectively laying off over 200 people with no warning and no severance. They were not alone, either. Telltale's sudden shattering happened within days of Capcom Vancouver closing and big fish laying off over a hundred people, meaning the game industry lost two big studios and over 500 jobs in the course of a week. In retrospect, this seems a particularly bad year for mass layoffs in the game industry. While Skybound Entertainment works to finish up Telltale's final working, that came with at least some of the original developers. The once beloved studios broke sold down and failure to pay workers what they are owed, inspiring at least one class action lawsuit. Joe, many to ask, will TDLLTALASFAILU be a catalyst for industrial reform? This year, Steam's polite dominance of the PC games industry appears shakier than ever. Seem perhaps most clearly the week Valve announced it was formally creating new rev share tiers that give big sellers a break by cutting its take on big earners. The standard 30% take drops to 25% on all post September earnings over $10 million and 20% over $50 million. Valve seems to be making a serious play to keep top game makers from taking their work elsewhere in the years ahead. This has never been more viable, now that multiple publishers, including Bethesda, Ubisoft and Electronic Arts, and it comes right as Epic and Discord, are opening up their own online game marketplaces with much better rev share rates. Most importantly, Valve is making this concession to big game makers, even as smaller devs continue to struggle with discoverability problems in a market overflowing with remarkable games. Low profile on each game scan is a legat loss in the mix, especially when Valve is tweaking Steam's recommendation algorithms in 
ways that drastically affect some devs' earnings. Once upon a time, just getting your game on Steam meant nearly guaranteed sales success. Now, most devs could be forgiven for seeking greater postures in which to launch their next game. Loot box reward systems have been a thing in games for years. But after the battlefront imbroglio of 2017, they caught the attention of media outlets outside of games.